Take your Bibles and find Revelation 17. This is another little bit of backstory or meta story or some kind of story like that in, in that's it's more information given. It's 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 another perspective. Really, chapters 17 and 18 are chapters of perspective and from God's perspective. And so they definitely aren't falling like chronologically, like we want to read a book and think that everything's falling in order, that these two chapters take something that God is calling Babylon, and he wants us to see Babylon, how he sees Babylon, and what is really going on in the judgment that is coming during the time of tribulation and really most more intensely during the latter years of the seven-year tribulation. Now, y'all recall uh, last Sunday that we went through chapters 15 and 16, which were covering the chronological order of the wrath poured out by God during the tribulation period, and the last of it being the seven bowls or the seven vials of wrath poured out in rapid succession, and it all coming uh, to a head at um, Armageddon, and the battle that ensues there and is really taken to Jerusalem, and according to Joel chapter 3, is really executed in the, the valley of Jehoshaphat, you know, in, there in that valley between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. Now, but now we go back and God offers a perspective and how he sees, well, we would say Babylon, but it has so much more to do with Babylon. It's something very ancient, and I don't have a whole lot of time I've got to remember this morning. Uh, <laughs> let me read, and I quit talking. Wait. I'm sorry I left my glasses back there. There. These are these are transition glasses. So if you do this, I feel like I need to take a Dramamine when I do that. But I'm okay just reading right here. But uh, okay, chapter seventeen it says, "And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come, here." I shall show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the king of kings, uh, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of unclean things of her immorality. And upon her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and, the, and of the abominations of the earth. Let's pray. Father. God, lead us in your word and instruct us in it, Father. And Lord, open our eyes and bless us to see that which you'd have us to see, Father. And give unto us, Lord, what, is, what, it, what pertains unto our lives and how we can apply it even to ourselves, Lord. And understand the world around us, Father, how we can better know you, Father, through this word and the purpose for which... You preserved it for us, and you said that the one who reads this book is blessed, and, and so let us be blessed in you, Father, because we, that's what we want. We want you, and we want your blessing, and not the things that the world has to offer and the things that the devil will promise. So, Father, we pray, Lord, for the working of your Holy Spirit in us. Uh, Father, for your intervention for my lack of knowledge. God, that your church might be edified. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we ask you. Amen. And uh, I'm not trying to be tacky when I say his intervention for my lack of knowledge, because I very loosely uh, have studied and understand eschatology. 
I mean, I can bounce around to the main places in Joel and Zechariah and Ezekiel and, and Daniel and kind of slowly put things together. I can't really recount them and outline them, you know, so well and great. And it's just kind of loosely put together. But I know enough to read through the chapter and make references. And, uh, and, uh, and according to Chuck Smith, that, that, that's legitimate Bible teaching. And so, and so, and rather, I suppose it's okay because it removes the emphasis from me and places it on Scripture. But there are some things uh, not hard to point out about this, and that this is a chapter somewhat you could call it parenthetical. But you, we, it blesses us to see the world the way God sees the world. And if you want to know what God thinks of something, read his word and he'll tell you. And so John, after the pouring out of the bowls of wrath, after he saw that, well, then one of those angels came and said, hey, come here and I'll show you. And he showed, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And so now this, both chapters 17 and 18 are in regards to Babylon. Chapter 17 addresses Babylon as in a, in a religious sense. Chapter 18 addresses Babylon in a governmental sense, if you will. And government and religion have been intertwined since Genesis chapter 10. I mean, <laughs> for instance, way, way back when Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and, and that began very much back then and intertwined because in religion there is power and governments recognize that and they want to use that. And and so they, they just cannot, as much as we would like to separate them, the nature of man always wants to join them. That's one of the reasons the forefathers of this nation looked back on world history and looked over it and they said, mm, you know what, it's good if the government stays out of religion. You know, and and so that's why they wrote into our Constitution, you know, uh, the separation of church and state. And, you know, they said that's not a good idea. They knew what it was like to have a king as a pope. And, you know, and, and the havoc that that causes. They knew uh, Roman Catholic history and what that caused. They they knew early church history and Constantine, and, and what that led to. And so they very much wanted to separate it, and we're trying to separate it, and we've tried to separate it, but nevertheless, it's becoming undone, and it will be the demise of this country. But he said, I'll show you the great harlot. And, you know, in this sense, it's, Babylon is presented as a, a harlot who sits on many waters, and later again in another, in another image, who sit on a scarlet beast. And, and from the beginning... God has used, I'll say, religious betrayal, because religion is betrayal, as uh, he's used the illustration of fornication or adultery or sexual immorality, you know, to help us understand what it's like when we, or man in general, betrays God. In fact, he devoted an entire prophet's life in a book in the Bible to that very illustration. His name was Hosea. And he said, Hosea, go take a wife of whoredom. You know, go marry a prostitute. And he led Hosea through this gut-wrenching, heart-breaking life that he went through, married to a precarious woman who went and sold herself. And, and he used that entire thing in Hosea's life as an illustration for him and his people. And he said, this is what you're like. You're like a prostitute that goes and, you know, and sells herself into spiritual slavery. And you betray me and you cheat on me. And, and that's the way God very often has presented that to us, because we can understand that. Most people, unless you're psychopathic or sociopathic, know what it's like to be betrayed. And especially in a very intimate, sensitive relationship like a marriage. You know, or at least if you haven't, you can sure imagine, you know. And, you know, wives, you might tell your husband, if you, I'm gonna, I'll, we got a shotgun in the closet, you know what I mean? And if you ever think, <laughs> you know? And, but really what she means is you'll break my heart. I mean, it's really, you know, she, she, 
I mean, ultimately, if you want to look beyond the threat, you'll break my heart. And, I, you know, as rough and tough as our men are, if you're a, a remotely decent man and you've entrusted yourself to a woman and she were to betray you, she'll break your heart. And God uses that experience in our lives and in nothing else, the risk and the potential of that experience in our lives to help us understand. And he referred to Babylon as a harlot. In other words, uh, this prostitute, somebody who sold the sacredness of her body for material gain. That's really the ultimate illustration. Somebody that sold out the sacredness of their creation and their person in order to obtain something. That's what a prostitute does. And it's horrible. But spiritually, that's what we do. When we do something like that, when we commit sin in an intentional way like that, and so later explains to us what the many waters are, but they're you know, many people and nations that this harlot sat upon. And, and, in, in, and in verse 2 it says, With whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. In other words, they involved themselves in it, and they participated in it, and rather they used religion over the years very much for their own purpose. And verse 3, And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, uh, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. So we, we're familiar with the beast by now, right? It's a scarlet beast. And, you know, that the color scarlet has been perpetuated in history. I don't know if you knew the 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 crusade colors of the the dark ages catholic church back there in the you know the 9th 10th 11th 12th century be uh uh when the catholic church i think it was what pope the innocent the third that you know he ordered the crusades and he established uh, transubstantiation and this isn't a dig on the catholic church this is just history you know, and, and what were the colors that they established themselves to be? It was scarlet, you know, and you go later on, and what was the what are the colors of the communist uh, parties among all nations? It's scarlet, you know, and, and you see the ideologies of any kind of satanic ideology in man is so commonly scarlet, scarlet, scarlet. You, it's not hard to find in, in world history having that repetitious pattern. And, but she was clothed in scarlet, uh, full of blasphemous names. In other words, you know, so much about her was contrary to God. And this beast having seven heads and ten horns, and, you know, we know all the way back from Daniel, this is referring to. And some people have, you know, referred to it as a picture of the Antichrist, but then Antichrist is also among that Antichrist, you know, that he's one of the heads, and he was the eighth, right? Uh, but... Uh, it tells us later on. But really, I, I think a better perspective of it would be Satan's kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. You know, this, and it's been going on for some time, but it's really going to be manifested and emphasized during this time. But there she was, what resting upon Satan and his kingdom, if you will, the kingdom of darkness. And and not only that, verse 4, it says, And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, not necessarily ugly. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. You could ask a question. John didn't say that she had the name prostitute written on her. How did, she, how did he know she was a prostitute? Well, I'll give you a 99% chance because she was dressed like a prostitute. And she looked like a... Y'all ever notice that, that prostitutes don't dress conservatively? <laughs> Isn't that something? Among all nations... I mean, anywhere you go, you go over to Thailand. What do you know? You don't even know if it's a guy or a girl. But, you know, and, you know, and how are they dressed? Provocatively. You go here in Arlington, and how are they dressed? Provocatively, you know, in the Old Testament. 
There's accounts of, you know, men going along and encountering a prostitute and inquiring of them. How did they know? Uh, you know, they said, well, she put on the raiment of a prostitute. Uh, I believe a daughter-in-law did that one time to uh, make sure she conceived. <laughs> you know, and, and she wooed her father-in-law into a relationship. How? Well, she dressed as a prostitute and he didn't have any trouble, you know. And isn't that enough to make us to understand that there is something in this world about conservative attire and that your body is not there to be sold and offered up to whoever will gaze and to whoever will look and you know and so obviously it was by her appearance you know that, that she was identified as a prostitute but you know she wasn't an ugly prostitute you go to Las Vegas prostitutes aren't necessarily ugly they don't you know necessarily you know have written on the front of them STDs and horrible emotional problems and a high probability of, of suicide and drug addiction and all those things. But, you know, they, you know, how was she? What did she look like? Well, she was clothed in purple and scarlet. That, that's high-dollar clothing in the historical propriety. That's something really nice. That, you know, she went to Neiman Marcus, evidently, and, and got her wardrobe. And, you know, something that looked very good. And she was adorned, what, with gold and precious stones and pearls. And I think that's so important to realize that the seduction into religion is not something that's done with an ugly appearance, but with great flattering promises of prosperity, you know, and peace and comfort. And all those things, do you know how Adolf Hitler convinced the Volk? Isn't that something? The Volk community? Y'all know the Volk community? Uh, it was not too different from something that sounds similar today. But it was, it, that was the community that he began to generate to convince people that the Jews were the reason why they just weren't really doing what they should do and being everything they should be and that they needed to promote the Aryan race and, and be super duper. And if they would listen to him and follow his, that they would create the utopian society of the Aryan race and be the superpower of the world and have such a better, and they made all of these, you know, he, he had all of these promises of prosperity and wealth and power and prestige and, and it's the thing that seduced them. In fact, that's the seducing cell of Marxism in any fashion. That we're going to create this wonderful utopian society. And that it's going to be this, this great thing where we're, everybody's going to have what they need to have. In fact, we'll all have you know, things in abundance because we're all going to be working together. They, they, they overlook the fact that this nature of man is to sin continually, which evidently turned out in the 20th century to be a really critical factor, you know, for communism working out, because so far it's not working out very well. And we did a lot of experimentation to the tune of 100 million people dying in the 20th century, trying to make it work. But nevertheless, young people, think about that. Uh, they worked for 100 years, you know, almost, to try to make it work at the, at the expense of a lot of lives. So if you're tempted to believe that what Karl Marx wrote and Engels wrote is a reality. Until man is sinless, it is not. It's just not. But it was with great promises, right? She was, you know, purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and something that looked and had great promise. And uh, having her hand, what, in, a, in her hand, a golden cup. But the problem is the gold is on the outside, and Jesus said, well, make sure the inside is good. You know, but inside, what was it? It was full of abominations and of unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead is this name written in a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and, the, and of abominations of the earth. Now, this is something that has carried all the way from Genesis chapter 10 throughout scripture now there was a an empire called babylon that's the the that's the nation that carried judah the southern nation and uh, judah and benjamin they carried them off into captivity and of course you know they were there for 70 years and they came back ezra nehemiah zerubbabel you know that that crowd 
that, um, but this is referring to something else. Uh, it's, uh, I believe that when God says Babylon, he's referring to an ideology, a mentality, a system, if you will. And that system was first, you know, exposed. And in this sense, we're talking about religion. I believe that Cain is the first example of secular religion. Now, there's two words, you know, there's secular. In fact, what I think I titled the day, the sinister seculum. The sinister seculum, secular comes from the Latin seculum, which meant really a generation of time. Oh, you know, in, in, in this seculum, and this seculum would be over when all of us are dead, right? And that's what, that was how they referred to a, a time period. We, we refer to it in generations, right? Like the baby booners and Gen Z and Gen X and millennials and all that. But, but really it came, you know, they, they took that word seculum and made it into secular, meaning, you know, according to the current times, they're like, well, how, you know, what does secular mean? Well, it says according to the vibe of the world around us. According to however the, the world or our time and setting is thinking, that that is secular. Well, whatever people think, well, whatever people are doing, you know, secular, you know, Germany in the 30s and 40s was, hey, let's get rid of the Jews and let's build the perfect Aryan race. You know, that was their secularism. Today, our secularism is, is progressing towards, well, there, there is no definitive gender. You know, it's just it's gender fluidity, and, and that's just part of our, our secular mentality today here in the United States and among other countries as well, primarily Western countries, Western, not Western geographically, but Western in terms of ideology and, and culture, Western culture countries. And so that's, that's secularism. You know, the antonym for secularism is sacred. So there are things that are secular and there are things that are sacred. And it's very important, I believe, for the Christian to understand what is secular and what is sacred. You know, because the flavor of your birthday cake this year is secular. That's fine. You know, God has let some things be secular. Yeah, you know, whatever you want to do, you know, that's fine. You know, I don't, God didn't say thou shalt have a chocolate birthday cake. I've been looking for it. And I haven't found it yet. But really, you know, what, what kind of shoes are you going to wear? Well, that's, that's a secular decision. You know, your birthday, you know. What, what about marriage? Oh, no. For this cause man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And the two shall be one flesh. Oh, no, God weighed in on that. In the beginning, God, right? and he created male and female. And, you know, and, you, and so you come to another thing, and you're like, oh, well, that's not secular, that's sacred. Your property is sacred. Do you know that? Thou shalt not steal. God, it's not like you said, no, this is my property, and I say you can't take it. No, God has said that somebody else should not take it. That's not a secular opinion. That's a sacred principle, that your property is sacred. Your marriage is sacred. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The truth is sacred. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And you start to see, you're like, well, how can I tell what's what? Well, what God has weighed in on and declared is something sacred that's something from above. That's something, you know, given unto us for us to observe. And then, you know, those things which are not, you know, clarified by God. Well, you know, God has given us a lot of choices. I ate two kolaches this morning for breakfast, you know. And I could have had, you know, bacon and eggs or something, you know. And so, you know, you see that God has given us some things to do. But when it comes to worshiping Him, very much sacred. What Abel, he offered of the flock, an offering unto God, and God received it. Cain, what of the produce of the ground that he grew, what he offered it to God, and God had no respect unto his offering. Well, what happened? Well, Cain was the first inventor of secular religion. He ignored what God had instructed them to do. And he said, I'm going to worship God in my way. And I'm going to create my own way and my own thinking and I'm going to do this the way I want to do it 
And that was the first example that I can think of. See, Adam and Eve, that, that wasn't secular religion. They knew very well what they should do. They just out and out. They didn't try to worship God by eating the fruit. They just rebelled against him and ate the fruit. They didn't say, well, we're going to you know, have a different way to worship God. You see, when religion is created, that, you know, then it becomes a secular religion, and that's very much the epitome of Babylon. You know, it, it started, this idea started way back in Genesis chapter 10. There was a man named Nimrod who was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and maybe that would be better translated that he was a mighty hunter against the Lord, contrary to the Lord. And, um, and it says, In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech, Erech and Akkad and Kalne. And that, and you all know the rest of the story, I'm sure, that... Um, what did he do and what was his leadership there in Babel? And it said um, in, in Genesis 11, the beginning of chapter 11, it says, Now, now all the, the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city, a tower whose top will reach into the heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Lest we be scattered abroad. They're like, well, that's our choice. No, it's not. Because God said just a couple chapters previously, he said, uh, he said, as for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. And he wanted them to go out and to populate the earth and disperse among them. And here they came into this idea that was obviously very much contrary to the will of God. And they came up to a place and you see their wording in the things that they wanted to do. Let us build for ourselves. I think that's the, the, you know, the first indicator. We're going to do this for us, and not only that, but a tower whose top will reach into the heaven. And what was the motivation of that? You know, this is a few generations away from a flood. <laughs> and it's not hard to tell that God was disapproving of what they wanted to do. And I think it's very likely that they were probably trying to ensure a way that they could overcome God and sidestep God and, you know, build this tower that would be up high enough to escape another flood and not only that but you know if nothing else to reach into heaven to elevate themselves and the last of them really doing it more than anything and let us make a name for ourselves self-promotion and verse 5 the lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built and the lords and and the lord said behold they are one people and they all have the same language and this is what they begin to do now, I don't, I don't know like how y'all put language together and understand it, but I knew like if we were kids and we were doing something and my dad walked in the room and he said, you know, I make money, I work hard, I buy you things, and this is what you do. I, don't, I didn't have to be a rocket scientist to know this ain't good. You know, <laughs> this is not good. Obviously, he's not happy with what's going on. And he was not happy with what was going on. And you know the rest of the story, that he confused their language. And so that they could not keep this unity that they had and keep progressing in the direction they were going. And what did God do that day? What did God do that day? You, you have to realize that there was, there was something going on and God dispersed it. And for the last, whatever it's been, five, six thousand years, it's been in this dispersed, disorganized, ununified thing. And you know what? It's slowly coming back together. What was the danger of them being one people with one language, all unified? If that was the case, the Antichrist and the devil's agenda would have occurred five thousand years ago. Because the devil can take any particular seculum in isolation. He can take any particular nation or people group, and he can do what he did in China in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, you know? But you know what? China was isolated by their language, by their government and their culture, and it didn't necessarily spill over into all the other people. 
He can do what he did in Sudan just 20 years ago, you know, and, and what, what happened there and the genocide that was taking place. The devil, in an isolated sense, can take one people in one language and do what he did in Nazi Germany. He can do what he did in, in the Soviet Union through Stalin. You know, but you know, what kept that from, from going into all the earth? Do you realize that if all the people were one people with one language, that Nazi Germany would have been the Nazi world? That red China would have been the red world. That day God divided secularism with the division of languages so that at no one time would the devil's intervention in a government and a people group infect the whole world with such an ungodliness. But you know what? It's coming back to a unification. Technology has made it possible. You know how much of the world speaks English in other countries? A lot. <laughs> you know, with Google Translate, you almost don't even need to speak the same language. You've got technology. And, that, you know, and so what's coming back together is very much like what was going on in Babel. And Babylon is coming back together, and that's the very thing that Satan needs to happen in order to do what he wants to do, and, and that is to get this world to be under his thumb and his worship and his power and his dominion. You know, that is, you know, secular religion. And it's very much going to come back to that purpose and, 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 that, and what he's doing. So Babel started way back then a, a rebellion against God and a refusal to do things his way, and, you know, and making a name for themselves, and doing things their own way. And that ideology has been perpetuated through all of history, among many nations, and in many different times, to many different extents, you know, and all the way up until now. And now things are coming back to where they are going to be one people, unified. I said this before, I know you're probably tired of me saying, do you realize that the COVID response was the most unified effort worldwide since the Tower of Babel. I've asked some guys who know history a lot better than me on that, and they're like, no, we agree. Not even, not even you know, World War II, you know, compared as far as like, you know, these countries and those countries or World War I and trying to get uh, enough of the world unified, but that was the most worldwide unified response you know, and I'm not necessarily trying to say that it's evil or good, but I'm saying, do you realize the potential for things now? Now, you know, not the devil creating an agenda in an isolated country and, and doing that very thing. But at this point in time, he's working on a worldwide basis. And that's what the Antichrist will be. It won't be all these different governments. It'll be one government. One person, one power, one dictator, one thing to worship. And if you aren't worshiping that one thing, well, you're in big trouble. And that's the thing when, you know, when the scripture says Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, what is God referring to as Babylon? The independence of him. Really, the, it's the very worst thing that you could ever have, man's independence from God, because God is the only means of salvation, and independence from God means that you are lost. And that ultimately, independence will, from God will be in outer darkness and separation from Him. But what the, the mother of harlots and, the, and, and of the abominations of the earth. And he says, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. And you say, well, well, I thought this was religion. Yeah, exactly. You know, religion has killed more Christians in the last 2,000 years than anything else, right? And if you want to look carefully, even Marxism is religion. You know, what, what Hitler sold to Germany was religion. You know, even the Islamists, the Muslims, where they're the jihadists, that's religion. Even the most dark time of the Catholic Church, the Inquisition, estimated 900,000, I think it was the estimation is 900,000 Christians were killed by the Catholic Church. That's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot. You're like, well, what killed them? Religion. 
I mean, religious people doing religious stuff. And this will be intensely, y'all know the, the, the time of tribulation will be intensely religious. What God has put out was that this man is going to step on the scene as a savior, as somebody, he's the false Christ, and, and people are going to worship him. They're going to adore him. He's going to seduce them. What is he going to seduce them with? Oh, well, with purple and scarlet clothes, adorning gold and precious stones. Y'all, y'all remember the illustration that, that, that Daniel explained that, you know, through the division of spoil and the seduction and the promise of safety and well-being and, and, the, and the person that lived it out for us before Christ is Antiochus Epiphanes. How for three and a half years he wooed and seduced the, the Jewish people and they entered into a relationship with him. And, and, you know, midway through that relationship at three and a half years, what did he do? He went into the temple and he killed a pig. Like that really happened. That's, that's, that's history. Like that, that really happened. And at that moment, what did he do? He declared their law to be illegal, and they could no longer practice it. And anybody caught trying to practice the Mosaic law, well, they were subject to be killed. And he is a type in history of the Antichrist, and these people are going to be seduced with religion, and it's going to look good, and it's going to look promising, and it's going to look like he, he loves you, and he's going to save you, and it's going to be wonderful. But it turns out what that he, you know, uh, it was very much persecuting for the saints. I'll remember the, the saints that were under the throne in heaven who had been beheaded, right? And that the blood of the saints and with the blood of witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly, you know, in, in other words, he was in awe, but not good. He was shocked is a better word for us. I was shocked is what John said. I, you know, and, and the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I shall tell you the mystery of the woman and the, and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And the beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to come up out of the abyss and to go on and to go to, to destruction, and those who dwell on earth will wonder whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Now this refers to something a couple chapters back where it says that, you know, and explained to us that, um, that the beast, the Antichrist, will suffer some dramatic wound and head injury and you know and and what did he said that the beast who you know that you saw and he is not and he's going to come and what's going to happen at his coming that all those to all the unsaved people in other words whose name is not written in they're going to wonder and they're going to marvel at his restoration and at his recovery and at his return and and uh that they weren't written in the book of life, when they see the beast, that they're going to be marveling and wondering that he was and is not and will come. And verse 9, he says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Uh, I better read a couple more verses. You know, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. And the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth, and is among the seven, and he goes to destruction. Now, are you confused yet? You're like, what, there's seven? How could he have been the eighth? And how could he be among the seven if he was the eighth? And Daniel tells us more. And, uh, and probably Daniel chapter 7 is, a, is a, something short and easy to look at. First of all, I, I want to... I want to mention the Roman connection. The Roman connection. There is a connection between the Roman Empire and this these end times. And you're like, well, how you know, why do you say that? How do you know? If you go back, if you recall twice, Daniel was given two different visions, you know, in, in the progression of beasts. 
And what did they mean? And they were explained to him, well, these are four different empires, right? These are four different nations. And you go through them and he explained to them, you know, well, there's, you know, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Macedonian, the Roman, and the progression that they, I'm sorry, the, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Macedonian, and then the Roman. And they, and they went through those and he gave them to him twice in two different visions and verse 19 of Daniel 7, he says, Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, Rome. He said, I wanted to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. Ah, that starts to sound familiar, doesn't it? You know, over there, the beast that John saw, well, it already had the seven. But Daniel gives us a little more. He says, well, there's going to be ten, and, and three are going to be subdued. Well, you put the two together. Among the ten, Antichrist was what? He was number eight. Just like Revelation just said, there was ten. He was number eight. He subdued three, which left seven of whom he is among. Does that help? Yeah? And uh, you know, if you're like me, I sat at home, I was like, okay, so he's this guy, you know, and he wiped out these guys, you know, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it, you know. And <laughs> I was like, there he is, and he's still among the seven, right? And... um but that's what happened. And so, but did you, did you catch it? What, what empire is this? This is the Roman Empire. And what was its illustration? Well, this, you know, exactly what he said, that, um, you know, that it had ten horns, you know, and ended up with seven, and one subduing the other three. And you see the connection. Wow, there's a connection between the Roman Empire and the Antichrist and the end times. And yes, it, it will be most likely a European federation. A union of European nations, right, that are going to come together. And upon that, you know, they will be the carriers of this kingdom of darkness, this Satan's kingdom. And... Uh, and it says in verse 21, And I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the ancient days came, ancient of days came, and judgment was passed in favor of the high saints. So yes, you see, it is talking about this very thing. There is a connection, you know, between the Roman Empire and what was there. And it's even a little more freaky when you look here in the way it described it. And the very first thing, he said the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Do y'all know what city is the city of seven mountains or the city of seven hills? Rome. Romulus. You know, it was first built on Palatine, you know, hill. Mons Palatine. You know, in Latin. And there's six other mountains, you know, hills. They're not really mountains like we would call mountains because we have the Rocky Mountains, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're hills. It's the city of seven hills. Rome is the city of seven hills. If you ask me, boy, what's going to be the city Babylon? What's going to be the epicenter of this, of this Satan's kingdom? I believe it's going to be Rome. I believe it's going to be Rome. It was, it was that Roman Empire in Daniel that was depicted as having these seven heads, right? That, that it was that beast and that it was in that empire that the Antichrist was you know, subduing and, and reigning and ruling and it will be in that area, even in the future, you know, that uh, I think most likely Rome, because of the description given here, because of the association made with Rome in the book of Daniel. <clears throat> and it says that there are what, uh, those are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and there are seven kings, and five have fallen, and one is, and, ha and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. And the beast, which was and is not, is himself also an eighth, and he is one of the seven. And he goes to destruction. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour or for a season. There's that Greek word, an hour. Again, you know, for a time. 
And these have one purpose, that they give their power and authority to the beast. And so, what, you know, what will it be? It will be the convergence, the coming together of multiple nations, ten nations, in Europe to create this government. And they, when their one purpose is to give power to the beast, the authority to the beast. And, and these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because He is the Lord of the lords and King of kings. And, well, that's why, you know, why does He win? Well, He's God, you know. And um, those who are with Him, and those who are with Him are the called and chosen and faithful. And He said to me, the waters which you saw... Where the harlot sits is the peoples and the multitudes and the nations and the tongues. So she was on the scarlet beast in the sense of support and power. She was on the waters in a sense of domination and rule over the peoples, the multitudes and the nations and the tongues. And if you ever want to know what's a religion and what's truly the worship of God, any institution that ever tries to be the intermediate between you and God is a false religion, and you need to get away from that as soon as you can. There's one God and one mediator between God and man. I am not between you and God. I am just a guy on the side telling you stuff, and you please consider what I say, but the Lord give you understanding in all things. You know, I I can intercede for you and pray for you, but I am not your mediator between God. I mean, there's one, you know, the man Jesus Christ. There is no exclusivity in the, in the institution of man. We are not the only church. We are a body, a congregation. And there are many Christians among many denominations scattered out this whole world. You do not need Calvary Chapel to be saved. You look at some other denominations, some other religions, and you'll see something very different. You'll see a domination. You'll see demanding. We call it sacerdotalism in, in theology world, where you have to go through them. Jehovah's Witness, Latter-day Saints, even Catholicism. You look at their doctrine. Without the sacraments of Catholicism, you are lost according to them, and there's no way for you to be saved. Like, you, you know, that, what is that? That's, that's not, I'm not saying we can't have, you know, Catholics who are saved by the grace of God. But I'm saying it's a false religion. They're, they're putting themselves in the place of Jesus Christ and taking too much upon themselves. But what do they do? They stood upon the people and multitudes of nations and tongues in verse 16 and the twin horns which you saw and the beast these will hate the harlot and make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire like i thought they were buddies right i mean come on angel get your story straight weren't they buddies she was riding on a beast right well hey you go jump on the back of a siberian tiger and tell me how it works out right That's something like what happened, though. Do you realize that in the middle of all this religious seduction, listen, it's it's not going to happen far away from Jerusalem. It's going to happen, oh, right in the middle of Jerusalem. It's going to happen to millions. You know what, you know, Paul says is going to occur in this time? The apostate church and the great falling away. You know what I personally believe on, among the billion plus people in this world that claim to be Christians, yet do not reflect Christianity in Scripture, that when the rapture of the church occurs, a huge void is going to be left in their religious expectations and understanding to which the devil will step in to offer them a seducing answer. Like how are you going to get so many people in this world? How are you going to just the, the Catholic Church alone? Which I, you know, I hope is not a huge offense to anybody. But among all denominations who host the most unsaved people, they would be the largest, the very largest in the world of people who are just straight man-made religion and no relationship with God. And imagine how easy it will be for them. 
So you remember what the Antichrist does. Well, the first half, it's seduction, and it's wooing, and it's promising. And, you know, and what happens in the very middle? What did Jesus say when you see the abomination of de desolation? You know, uh, and, and, and somebody brought it up. You know, I mentioned a, a few weeks back, Iron Maiden, run to the hills is what he said. You know, run to the hills. You know, and, um, But that's what Jesus said. When you see that, run is what he said. Because in the middle of all these things, it will go from religious seduction to vicious persecution. No more Mr. Nice Guy if you want another song title, you know. Um, and so that's, you're like, well, how does this all turn around? How does she go from riding on the beast to being just, you know, hated by the beast and persecuted by the beast? Well, that's what the devil does. He promises you a good time and then gives you a hangover. You know, he says you're going to have the most meaningful relationship of your life and leaves you with a broken heart and STD. He says you're going to feel, you know, relaxed and better about yourself, and he leaves you with a drug addiction. He says you're going to get the revenge you deserve, and he leaves you with a bitter heart of unforgiveness. Yeah, I mean, that's his way. That's what he does. He, he woos you and he seduces you. And he's going to do this to the world with religion, to adore him, to worship him, to idolize him. That's what the world is going to do. And he's going to turn around and brutally massacre them. I mean, just viciously what Antiochus Epiphanes did to the Jews. And, you know, there, he's going to hate them and then make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire why verse 17 for god has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of god should be fulfilled be careful what you want to worship right <laughs> worship god or worship that which you want to dream up or which makes you feel better uh, somebody shared with me this week uh, a, an online pastor uh, character that teaches online and asked me what I thought about him. And honestly, I went and listened to about an hour of his teaching and heard a couple strange things, but nothing horrible. And, and then she sent me just one of his TikTok videos. <laughs> that was just heretical, you know. But, but, you know, she said that her coworker love this guy you know why because he made her feel good ah because he made her feel good you know and it was comfortable and it was good and 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 that's what rather than wanting to know the absolute truth and character of god god i will you make me comfortable i i want whatever's going to make me feel good whatever's going to make me comfortable or whatever maybe whatever's going to make me rich or whatever's going to make me healthy or, you know, or whatever's going to give me good pleasure. And they absolutely hated the truth of God. They chose their own truth. And then God really let them have the outcome of their own choice. And verse 18, And the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And what is that great city? Well, that'll be the, the Babylon of end times. You ask me, I mean, I'm not absolutely sure. I be believe it's Rome. Even the scripture says the sailors will look in astonishment. Well, you know, it's a port town. <laughs> you know, that, that'll be possible for them to look, you know, and uh, from the ocean and, and see in astonishment. But that is Babylon. That is, you know, it's false religion. It's invented religion. Does it have to be heretical? Does it have to be killing people? No, it just has to step one truth away from God. Just one truth away from God. Maybe that truth might be that you have to earn your salvation. Oh, that's Babylonian thinking. It's contrary to Scripture. Maybe that truth would be like, well, there is no real, you know, gender specificity to God. Well, that's a big enough step away, and it perverts God's image of Christ in the church. You know, maybe it would be the idea that, you know, that you just don't have to have any hard times in life, and God will just, you know, bless you to have the rest of your prosperity gospel. That's Babylonian thinking. That's leaving off the truth of God 
making up for yourself who God is and what you want it to be and trying to worship him in that way, making a name for yourself, building your own empire and doing it your way. Let's pray. Father, God, thank you, Lord, for your word and for giving us your great warning in it, Lord, and not that we're even immune, Father, to having that kind of thinking and that kind of desire, Lord. But God, let every one of our preferences be set aside. And uh, Lord, let us just have your way in the truth and nothing else, God. And that if you're not going with us, we don't want to go, Lord, like we learned from Moses. God, that if you're not going with us, we don't want to go. We want to know your way and not be persuaded by anything else. God, lead us in your truth. And we look forward to reigning with you. God, bless us to share your truth with others. Father, to know it, to have it, to be able to communicate it, Lord, by your grace. God, that others might be saved and know you too. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.